Oh, there we go. Uh, so, this is about um, gene pools and genetic drift. And oh, of course, you will recognise the fact that we are using a bean pool rather than a gene pool because it amuses me. <laughs> so, uh, so, we need to define a gene pool. Let's just be sensible for just a minute. Even though I've got beans instead of genes. So, gene pool. This is the total of all... Uh, ooh, I've got some new Sharpies. Ooh! <laughs> all alleles off. Off the Sharpies. <laughs> uh, of all genes. Getting a bit giddy now, it's nearly Christmas. Um, of all genes in a population. So why do we even bother having a term for that? Uh, that, you know, why? Just why? Well, the whole point is that, you know, you're dealing with variation and evolution and your gene pool, the point is to pass on your alleles. And the gene pool is what you can draw on, if you like, to pass your alleles on to the next generation. And whatever alleles get passed on from this gene pool is then going to make the gene pool of the next generation. And if we alter what's in that gene pool in any way, that could be the, the, in the gene pool of the next generation. And you'll remember when we were doing natural selection last year, uh, the last bit of that natural selection story was that over many generations, the allele frequency would change. So if our white bean allele is favorable, then we would expect it to be passed on a bit more into our next generation and these poor little red bean alleles would, would start to disappear. And if this is really favourable, even a higher proportion would be pressed onto the next generation. So that was the point, uh, just in case you missed it when you did it, of doing the breeding bunnies experiment, where they, you know, we said, right, if you've got one with two white alleles, it's hairless and it's going to die. Um, so that was to sort of bring the, the natural selection story and gene pool stuff together. That was the point of the breeding bunnies experiment. But we're not going to talk about natural selection today. We're going to talk about genetic drift. So, genetic drift happens when you've got a very small population. And the smaller the population, the more likely it is to happen. And these genetic drift is random changes in allele frequency. So here I've kind of started off with equal numbers of red and white beans. So these are random. These are not down to any natural selection. It doesn't mean that something's got an advantage or a disadvantage in a particular situation. It's just that randomly it doesn't get passed on. So these are random changes in allele frequency. That can lead different frequencies and potentially uh, a loss of alleles over, I'm going to put short periods of time, I don't really mean that, I mean a few generations And we'll talk about the founder effect in a minute. So, for example, if randomly out of my gene pool, my next generation, the parents had had children with so we've got the, going into the next generation, we've got you know a homozygous purple bean, two homozygous white beans and two heterozygotes, then in our next generation 
our gene pool has more, slightly more white beans in than purple beans. And therefore we're more likely to have offspring with the white bean allele than the purple bean allele. That can cause changes, so the next generation after that it's again more likely that you would have more white beans and that proportion might go up and the proportion of purples might go down and again then it becomes more likely that you will pass on white alleles rather than purple alleles and so in a very short period of time you might find that there are no purple bean alleles at all in your next generation. And it can also be caused by random events, you know, if you're the sort of, you know, the only white flower in the field that produces white beans and you get trodden on, that's pretty much going to um, prevent you reproducing. So it's things that, it's kind of random events, if you like, uh, unexpected, not down to, you know, the white bean could be the most advantageous thing. And if I had a mutation to be able to photosynthesize, synthesize not only would I have green skin which would be very very cool but I would have to be able to pass it on to my offspring for it to have any significant advantage but it wouldn't matter how advantageous that characteristic was if I uh, walked out in front of a bus and got killed before I could pass it on so that's the idea of genetic drift sort of slightly related to that is the founder effect so if you imagine a, an ancestral population and this is kind of what happened in the Galapagos uh, finches, so the the populations on the Galapagos are derived from the mainland, but they don't necessarily represent the allele frequency of their parent population. So if I sort of took that bit of the population, there'd be a lot more white alleles would end up on the islands, but if I took this bit of the population randomly they're not necessarily evenly distributed. I'd have more purple ones in my in my ancestral population. And again, then, because you're removing a small population, you're more likely to get these random events that might cause lower or higher allele frequencies. So that's called the founder effect, when you take a section of the population with a non-representative um, allelic frequency. So I've talked about allele frequency, um, I've mentioned that about, I don't know, eight times in the last two sentences. So I'll just quickly say what we mean by allele frequency. So, because this will, I think, lead us nicely into Hardy Weinberg in some later, kind of more in the mood video. So, allele frequency, what do we mean by that? We mean the proportion of an allele and we're usually talking out of a pair remembering that we have got multiple alleles and all the rest of it but we're usually talking about one allele out of a pair proportion of an allele in a population expressed in the way we write it down as a percentage or decimal. Now percentages to decimals are not difficult. If you've got 38% of something, what that means is 38 out of 100 if you put that into your calculator, which to be fair you shouldn't really need to, if you're dividing by 100 you're skimming the decimal points back, it's 0.38. So that means that 0.38 means 38 hundredths, so we've got two decimal places, which means 38%. So, you know, don't get tied up with your calculators. I know you're very fond of them, but your brain goes to mush once you get one in your hand. So. In my population here, so I've got my bean pool, and I've got 50 white beans and 50 purple beans. Now all that means is I know that these will be hidden inside of my organism and I can't just count them. So that's why we do Hardy-Weinberg, because we can't just count the alleles, usually. 
You could with a co-dominant cross, but not with normal recessive. Um, so in my gene pool, these will be in individuals, in pairs. And if we've got a dominance recessive go thing going on, so if my white is dominant over the purple, these two will look white and this one will look purple. And that's just the way it goes. That's just straightforward genetics. If I've got 50 of each, that means my gene frequency for the white allele is 50% or 0.5 and my gene frequency, my allele frequency for my purple allele is 50% or 0.5. But it could be, you know, any percentage. And that's what Hardy Weinberg's about.